Welcome back to Book Club. Well, at this point, we will have read at least 10 chapters of Northanger Abbey. And what these videos, and it will be videos plural, are going to do is answer some questions, some things that I think may require some explanations, and give you some insights into Jane Austen's world. And that's what we're going to start off with today, Jane Austen's world. So, when we come back. I should start by saying that this is the second filming of this video I've made. The first one went over an hour. So what I'm doing with this is I'm breaking it down into bite-sized chunks. I'm going to try to keep them approximately a half an hour and I will also try to organize them according to topic. So. If you want to know about Austin's world, this is the video you're going to watch. If you want to know about the literature cited in Northanger Abbey, there will be another video, etc., etc. And I will do my best to um, to keep the videos a true to topic without too many digressions. Okay. Austin's world. The first thing we need to discuss whenever we discuss Austin's world is the clergy of Regency England. And the reason for this is in, um, well, she wrote seven complete novels, and in six of them, major characters are clergymen. Uh, in two of them, yes, baby, in two of them, clergymen are the object of affection of her heroines um, in others they in well in two others they are gentlemen who are courting our heroine and in the last two of our seven uh, they are major characters or their their interests are important to the story the seventh is Lady Susan, an epistolary novel, which is very different from all the rest. It's sort of in a category all by itself. So, when we start talking about Austen, we have to remember that she was the daughter of a clergyman. As a consequence, this really influenced her views about the clergy, her deep personal familiarity with the life of a clergyman and in general what the clergy was in Regency England. So in Northanger Abbey our hero is a clergyman. Our heroine is the daughter of a clergyman. Her elder brother, um, eldest brother actually James, is to become a clergyman. So it's a major influence in the book. So, within the first few pages, we learn that Catherine Moreland's father, Mr. Moreland, uh, we learn his name is Richard, he is a clergyman. He has a considerable independence, those are Austin's words, plus two good livings. So, let's talk about what a living is. Uh, a living is what what is formally known and formally, please forgive me, the palsy is making some of my uh, pronunciations a little sloppy, Form, formally known as a benefice. It was also formerly known as a benefice because this was a tradition that came to the Anglican Church from the Catholic Church. And from the 6th century right through the 16th century, so we're talking a thousand years, 
England was at least nominally a Catholic nation. And for the 300 years preceding Austin's time, it was Anglican, but they still had the strong Catholic traditions, much of which passed to them intact at the time of the Reformation. You know, it's like everything's the same except the king is the head of the church. So, um, a living is a benefice. And benefice, we can tell from the word right away because of the connection to benefit, is the income uh, of a particular church. And in England, each church was largely independent. And at the time of the Reformation, uh, more than a third of the churches um, the livings, the the uh, the benefices, the income allocated to a particular church was at the disposal of a private, non-religious individual. This sometimes happened because the Lord of the Manor uh, gave some of his property to and and his income to build a church and a parsonage. He might have a few farms that would be rented out, that income would support the church. So the benefice is the money, basically the income, the revenue of a church. Mr. Moreland was the patron and the incumbent of one of those livings, which means this was part of that considerable independence of his, probably consisted of lands from some ancestor and although the land that the church was built on and the land of the parsonage and any land that might have been given to the church for its support, in other words farms that would be rented out, the rental money would then support the church, that all belonged to the church but the patron uh, the original term was the advowson, was, and that, that would have been the Lord who was in charge of this whole process. The patron would have retained rights, including the right to appoint the person who had the living. So, Lord Smith goes to Mr. Jones, a clergyman, and says, I shall give you this living, or more likely and more commonly would say, I shall sell you this living. And Mr. Jones would pony up a certain amount of money that they would agree upon, and then he would be entitled to all of the revenue that was allocated to that church. And he would then have the responsibility of making sure that the ecclesiastical duties, in other words, somebody has to preach the sermons and somebody has to visit the poor and do all those things that a clergyman does, Mr. Jones would be responsible for making sure that work took place. Either he would do it himself or he would designate someone else to do it and pay them out of the benefice, out of the living. In practice, you can see where this would be highly open to abuse. And in fact, in 1838, which is like, what, 25 years after Austin was writing, Parliament put serious restrictions on the custom of having multiple livings. They called it plural benefices. And 12 years later, they further restricted it. And in fact, I don't think they do it today. And I don't even think that the advowson is still, I think the church appoints people according to merit and not just according to who might be in favor of the local Lord or who might be offering him the most money for the living. So you have a situation where Mr. Moreland has two livings and he is probably paying someone. Um, and keep in mind, you had vicars and curates and rectors. So there were all kinds of levels 
of clergymen who could conduct the church services, and visit the poor, and do all the other things that a clergyman is expected to do. And they would be paid accordingly. There was like, you know, a pay scale that would have been based on a number of things, including the title of the clergyman, whether he was a curate or a rector, the duties, and the wealth of the church. Because in addition to whatever lands the the nobleman might have originally, and this could have been like a thousand years ago, whatever lands that, you know, the great, 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 great grandpa may have allocated to the church, the income from the church is also comprised, at least in part, of tithes from the local parishioners. So, Mr. Moreland has two livings. He is patron and incumbent of one. So one of these is probably part of that considerable independence, undoubtedly consisting of land. Um, and he's a well-to-do man. We are accustomed to thinking of clergymen in very different terms. Well, we look at a clergyman as someone who is dedicated to the church, believes the doctrine, wants to serve God. It's a calling to us. To them, it was a job. Um, and keep in mind that they were in a society that was very homogeneous. Most of the people belonged to the same religion. Uh, there were religious minorities, but they were tiny minorities. Uh, so for them, it was a job, and it was a job that could be held by a gentleman, and that gentleman would not lose his position in society as a gentleman through this employment. And there were a few kinds of employment in which a person could still be considered a gentleman yet work for a living. The military was one of them, the clergy. Uh, Politics was another. Um, but trade, um, if you were the son of a gentleman and decided to become a plumber, uh, you weren't a gentleman anymore. So that leads us into our next topic, which is the economy and the class structure of Regency England. You had the nobility and the royalty at the very top. You had the gentry below them. These were usually landed families. They were not noble, they were not royal, but they weren't plumbers either. And then you had everybody else. England was just barely beginning to see the emergence of a middle class Usually that was tradespeople, but keep in mind that when we talk about middle class as Americans without an aristocracy uh, and without even a history of that aristocracy in our country, we are talking about economics. For them, they were talking about class. So you could be a butcher, and if you were a very industrious butcher, you might become very wealthy. Or... Conversely, you could be the ninth son of a duke and, you know, you have nothing to your name but a chamber pot. The ninth son of a duke was still a gentleman, even if he just had that one little chamber pot. The highly industrious butcher could have a vast fortune. And he was not a gentleman because they defined it by class um, socially, not economically. So, it's very important, and always had been, because this is a European thing, it's not just an English thing, but your class was very important. People would scramble to get into the gentry. Uh, someone whose grandfather had been in trade, you know, would stop working, go get a little um, country manor and with a little bit of land and rent it out and live on that income and that plus two generations equals a gentleman. 
even though his grandfather was in trade, and they would cling to that. Jane Austen herself was a gentlewoman. Her father was a gentleman, but they were poor, poor people. They were as poor as church mice. And in fact, your average butcher was probably better off than they were economically. So when we talk about the class, were they middle class, were they upper class, were they lower class, for us, the words carry very different meanings. Catherine Moreland would have been of that, that sort of cream level of gentry. Also, of course, her family was wealthy. Um, we do not know a lot about Catherine's life before she went to Bath, because Austin doesn't tell us. She glosses over that. It's um, We have a few pages of Catherine in Fullerton, her little village, and then we immediately go to Bath. Uh, critics have, have pointed this out, that this is a flaw in the work. Who knows? Clearly, this was a period of Catherine's life that Austen did not find personally interesting and did not expect her readers to find interesting either, so she scoots on and her story really begins in Bath. So, what is Catherine's economic situation? Well, considerable independence tells it all. Economically, her family was quite well off. When she goes to Bath, uh, her father gives her 10 guineas. 10 guineas today, by the way, because a guinea is a quarter of an ounce of gold, would be worth about $5,000. Um, at the time, it was worth 10 and a half pounds. What we know from Pride and Prejudice, and, and fortunately, you know, Austin did do some other writings and we can draw on this. Lydia Bennett, her uh, expenses, the cost of her board and pocket money, what it cost to keep Lydia at home was probably about 90 pounds a year. So we can safely say that this for six weeks stay in Bath would have been a fair representation of what it would have cost keep a young woman. Um, so there, there you have it. So we have a reference and it's pretty standard right across the board. Is this consistent with um, uh, the kind of allowance you would have expected a young woman whose father had a considerable independence plus two good livings to have for six weeks? It's probably a little less than one would have expected. But given the fact that the vast majority of the wealth in England at the time was consolidated it, within 5% of the population, um, you had people who had money and you had people who were just dirt poor. And 5% had money, 95% were dirt poor. Um, so what we have is a family that is wealthy, but I don't think Austin really did the math very well. And she certainly did not represent uh, Catherine's life in Fullerton as the life of a young woman whose father had a considerable independence. So, is it consistent? Well, I guess the other side of it is, is it really important? You know, it's because it's not so much what the story is about. However, the entire story is underpinned by economics, um, by how much money James or John Thorpe thinks that the Morelands have, how little money General Tilney eventually comes to think the Morelands have. And in the end, you find that what they have is somewhere in the middle. So, I got a question uh, from one of our book club members about uh, Jane, uh, 
sorry, Catherine Moreland's situation socioeconomically. Would she have been middle class or upper middle class? Well, there wasn't much of a middle class. She would have been a gentlewoman. Therefore, I am inferring that by definition, she would have been upper middle class. She would have been on the, probably the middling level of gentry, which I would suppose since that would have firmly placed her within that top 5% economically, would have made her upper class. So hopefully that will be something of an explanation for this. The next thing I want to get into is bath, because this is a huge part of um, the world of Northanger Abbey. So Catherine Moreland starts off in Fullerton a village in Wiltshire, and you know she's playing and she's rolling down the green hills. And what do we know about Wiltshire? Well, Stonehenge is there. So when you're picturing Catherine rolling down the green hills, picture Stonehenge in the background, because that's where the opening chapters are set. Then she goes to Bath. Bath is 19th century England's version of Disneyland. You go to Bath for a vacation, and here's how it works. You pay a subscription fee. You either pay this independently or as part of your lodging. So you go in, you sign into a hotel or you know, rent rent rooms, uh, which is you know, basically going into a hotel. Bath was a resort town. And either you pay the, the subscription fee independently or you pay it as part of your rent for the rooms. And that entitles you to whatever bath has to offer, all of the amenities. The amenities include the pump room, and let me show you a picture of the pump room very quickly. All right, pump room. That's where you go to get the water. And at the time, they believed that drinking a glass of water from the underground springs, uh, the Romans had built that. Bath is a Roman town. The, the Romans had built Bath on the site of an underground spring, and they got this idea that the water from Bath could cure anything, especially gout, but it could cure rheumatism or, you know, whatever you had, the catarrh, who knows what they had. They didn't know what their illnesses were. I certainly don't. But whatever they were, a nice glass of bath water was going to cure it. And when I say that, it's like bath water, my goodness, you know, all I can think of is that stuff with, you know, it's, I don't know, gray and slimy from the bath oil. Mm. But the pump room was one of the amenities. They then had two different sets of rooms that were open to the public. These were the upper rooms and the lower rooms. Now, when we think of upper and lower rooms, we're inclined to think of, well, this is the first floor room and that's the second floor. No, these were separate, separate buildings, separate sets of rooms. So um, some of them would have uh, the balls. Some of them would have had the plays and the concerts and, and other uh, activities, like I say, um, this is the early 19th century version of Disneyland. Fun, fun, fun. Whatever they considered fun. And I'm not really sure what it was. They didn't have cable TV. So, in addition to the public places like the pump room, like the assembly rooms, they would have all kinds of little shops. Because remember, this is a resort town. So, in any resort town, you are going to have a number of merchants catering to the tourist trade. One of the interesting things about Bath is that Bath, for many, many years before this period, we're going back into the 18th century at this point, one of the, the, the sort of rules of Bath was that if you paid your subscription fee, it didn't matter if you were a duke or a bricklayer. Uh, 
you were entitled to all the same amenities. So you would go into the pump room. If you were a bricklayer, you could be walking side by side with the Duke and no one was allowed to be critical of this. Um, Bath also had a person who was a master of the ceremonies. Originally in the 17th century, I'm sorry, it's the 18th, in the 18th century, my apologies. In the 18th century, this was a gentleman who lived in Bath who just by the sheer force of his personality maintained order in Bath and made sure that if anybody was rowdy, they would be scooched off and just one guy. And when that one guy passed on, they, they actually created the position. They realized how valuable and useful it was, so they created a position of the Master of Ceremonies. And the Master of Ceremonies in Austin's time was a man named Mr. King. And when Austin uses that name, this is very interesting, it's one of the very few times, the only time I can recall, and I don't want to say the only time, period. Um, I'm awfully familiar with Austin's work, and this is the only time I can recall she actually made a reference to a real person. The convention at the time was, if, if you would say, you know, uh, if you were going to say the Duke of Devonshire, for example, uh, you would write the Duke of D blank. You wouldn't mention the name but she mentions Mr. King's name. So that is what is going on in Bath. Now let's take a look at, uh, I'm just going to give you a whole bunch of pictures here. Um, we're going to look at the upper rooms, the lower rooms, the octagon room, which does not play a very important part in Northanger Abbey, but it is very specifically mentioned in Persuasion. So we're going to look at the octagon room, which is one of the assembly rooms. Um, and Catherine and the Allens stay in Pulteney Street, so we're going to look at that. And General Tilney is staying in Milsom Street, so we're going to look at that. So got some pictures to give you a little sense of what Bath was like. Now, most of these pictures are modern. I was able to get one that was from the 19th century. Um, so, here you go. So that's Bath. This is, as I said, this is Disneyland. So, in summation, a clergyman was a job like any other. It did not require you to be religiously devout or dedicated to the church or service to God. It was one of the few jobs a gentleman could hold and still retain his dignity as a gentleman. Um, as, as I said, the military was another, so we will see that a lot of Austin's heroes are military men as well as clergymen. Um, economically, Catherine Moreland would have been in the upper echelons, uh, although not important. She's, she's off in a village somewhere. Um, we know what her, her family's economic circumstances are, and we know she's country gentry. Um, what else? We have, and we have Bath, and we have the fact that she grew up in the shadow of Stonehenge. So that is our world, the world in which Northanger Abbey is set. All right, we are going to sign off with our happy little... Horizon slideshow, and I'm going to pick this up with 
another video with some other information. All right, we'll see you next time.